Welcome. We all have hearts full of reasons to be here. We come because we want to stay in this season of Thanksgiving and we want to bring our best. Our voices, our music, our embraces. We come because we are hoping to find a compass, because we are drifting or have been cast adrift. We come because we need to know that there is more to our world than strife and hatred and that we might somehow be part of a solution. We come because we trust in this time we will have a better sense of who we are and know that we are cherished just as we are. We come because we are looking for a better sense of who we can be and perhaps find a step or two to help us on our path. Some of us have come just so we can sit here. whatever you bring or don't bring today. You are welcome. Thank you for caring enough about each other to be here. Thank you for caring enough about yourself to be here. Please join me in the gathering prayer. In this season of Thanksgiving, when we celebrate the satisfaction of our wants, and lend our worship to what pleases us. Help, Help us, us to, to say, say thanks, and, and to say no more thank, thank you, that we may say we are living by a word that feeds our souls. As we float along on the low humming music of fulfilled desires, we have been able to beat with our wealth and personal power Help us, us to step to, step to serving, serving others, others and follow the one who taught us how much is enough. Him. As we recline on our ability to weather any storm or cushion our fall if we accidentally get too close to the edge, help, help us, us to feel the, the vertical of, of individuality and step back, back into, into the, the grace of trusting of in you and your history of caring for us when we overstep ourselves. On the days we are tempted to see ourselves at the center of this universe, self-sufficient, powerful, even invincible, not just into the wilderness where we can be alone with our thoughts and learn to pray. Amen. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by her in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until another opportune time.
weeks. That's our lifespan in the Western world, if we're lucky. Prosperous West. If you make it to 90, that means you've got another 500 weeks. In the long run, Oliver Berkman, in his book, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortal, says, in the long run, we're all dead. And that might fill you with anxiety. It could relax us. It could help us to seek the value in our lives. Pay attention to, to change our priorities. He writes, and some of you have been reading this book already, he writes with understanding and wisdom about the attitudes that we sift through each day to help us make the most of our 4,000 weeks. And value is not found, he writes, in what we can get to make our lives better. It is found in the reasons we have to rejoice, the discoveries that we have to rejoice. We're going to look at portions of Berkman's book to help us consider not how to deal with the anxiety of knowing we've got a finite amount of time, but how we can joyously engage our days and how we might even understand Fairlawn in the future. And I'll say more about that in a bit. But joy, he offers, starts with embracing our finitude. We have a limited amount of time to live joyously. Now, when I, I'm going to interpret him a little bit here, but I don't mean, when I talk about joyously, I don't mean pleasurably, because living pleasurably embraces a commitment to eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we may die. That's living pleasurably. And living joyously doesn't, for my way of thinking, mean that I am happy all the time, either. Because happiness is transient, happiness is haphazard. Joy is that, for me, that joyous, that powerful flow through my life that includes happiness and contentedness and hope that even in the midst of adversity helps me face each day with peace and some days even optimism. It's epitomized in Paul's letter to the church in Rome where he says he is utterly convinced that nothing in heaven or on earth can separate him from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's joy. Joy is that powerful undercurrent that I've made a waterway for in my life by some combination of prayer and meditation and gratitude and developing nurturing, dependable relationships in my life. That's joy. And I want to swim in those waters for as much of my 4,000 weeks as I'm able. Does anyone want you to come with me to where there is little water and step with Jesus into the wilderness where he's faced with a temptation to drive himself literally into the ground. Throw yourself from the temple and see what happens, says the devil in the story. <laughs> Keep in mind that in Jesus' day, the average lifespan was 2,000 weeks. No pressure. It wasn't the devil who drove Jesus into the wilderness, though. It was the Spirit of God. He was going to get some needed time alone to figure out who he was and what he was going to do. But the devil, or in some versions, the tempter, ambushes him. He hits him where he may be weak and uncertain. Hungry? Make yourself some food. Think you should be doing greater things. I can set you up right away. Not sure if anyone cares. Do something stupid. See if God catches you. Berkman says that indulging that basic instinct to deny a future possibility for a current reality 
blinds us to seeing past the current reality. Let me do that again. Indulging the basic instinct to deny a future possibility for a current reality blinds us to seeing past the current reality. The current realities are demanding and they're anxiety producing. If we are focused on a task to do so that we're ready for the next one, I gotta get this done so I can be ready for the next one because it's gonna hit me anytime now, we lose track of what we were doing in the first place. Maybe even who we are, we become task fulfillers. And even if we have half an idea of why we're doing what we do and we maximize our time with productivity apps and techniques so we can fit more into each day. Berkman says the only thing that happens is we become more anxious, more empty. We end up on this conveyor belt of demands. There's no emergency stop button. And even if there were, we might be reluctant to hit it because then we'd have to deal with what other people thought of our inability to keep up. We'd rather hide the evidence than admit we can't keep up with the demands on us. And most of us, Berkman offers, invest a lot of energy in surviving that conveyor belt. And we manage to avoid fully experiencing reality. There's just too much of it. We recoil from the notion that this is it, that this life is the only one we'll get a shot at, writes Berkman. So oddly, we keep busy doing stuff. So throughout the book is this gentle and persistent question. What are your priorities? When you know hunger in a wilderness, it focuses your priorities. When you momentarily set aside your anxiety about whether or not you control your own destiny, you can ask yourself if you're on the right path to living those priorities. When you believe you have a place in creation that you belong, you don't have to jump off anything and cheapen your soul to fulfill it. We've grown accustomed to living in fear. All we can see is wilderness and not its lessons. We live in a constant state of fight or flight and our priority becomes survival and God knows enough of creation has had reason for fear this week. Fear drives us away from risk as it should up to a point, but only a point. If you're gonna be good at what you do, if you're going to have good relationships, you're gonna take risks. You're going to try things and, and be vulnerable without being sure of the outcome. Every decision, when you're willing to take risks, every decision represents a possible sacrifice. For Jesus, the sacrifice was one of possibility. But he took a stand on what mattered to him. He sacrificed food, recognition, and for a moment, even belief. We make better choices when we quit avoiding and denying our finitude. Confront it. I got 4,000 weeks, Ugh. or I got 4,000 weeks. I'm gonna take ownership of my life instead of distracting myself with busyness and that overabundance of possibilities. Decide. I have all these weeks left. What am I gonna do with them? What do I wanna look back on? that I embraced, that made me better and helped me make the world better. 
We call the story we read of the story of the temptation of Jesus more than we call it the story of Jesus in the wilderness. We read about his heroic responses to his temptations and we take them as examples of how to live. Know the scriptures, know your values. Trust, don't be a trial to the Holy One. Okay. But we forget that he got to be in the wilderness. What worlds of wonder did he see? What in creation did he get to celebrate? Throughout the book, Bergman is going to challenge us to see ourselves in a world of wonder. And one of his goals in the book is to have us learn to live in wonder. Start, keep doing it, learn it again. To live in wonder. We've become so task-oriented, we never give ourselves time to indulge curiosity and delight. We're so focused on getting that picture of the waterfall that we don't even feel the mist on our faces. We see a world full of obstacles to getting where we want to be instead of a place of wonder that we neglect to take time to appreciate or learn from. Own your decisions. Embrace your finitude. Experience the world. Hear these words from Psalm 90, which we often read at celebrations of life. Our years are 70, or if by reason of strength, 80. But they pass in trouble and sorrow, and we fly away. Teach us to number our days so that we might get a heart of wisdom. Okay? We know we're going to fly away. But why don't we learn to fly now? Why don't we have lives of soaring exploration instead of the anxiety of saving up just to cope with another day? Now, after six weeks with you at Fairlawn, here are some of the values I've recognized. We honor the exceptional, the brilliant, the hardworking. We honor those deemed by others to be unexceptional or less than unexceptional by caring for them and welcoming them. We value avoiding burning out. We value the rediscovery of and investment in our inheritance as a community of faith. Now there are others, but this is my starting point so far. As we build a future on the riches of talent and skill and spiritual insight we already find in each other. One of the reasons I'm here is that I want to swim and share joy with people who know and share joy with each other. By some combination of prayer and meditation and expressions of gratitude and developing nurturing dependable relationships, we can call out to the people on the banks like Delmer and O oh Brother, where art thou? Come on in, the water is fine. Now, if you think I'm wrong about Fairlawn, I'll give you a week to tell me. But I got, you know, another thousand to fifteen hundred I'd rather be doing better things with. Here's the last question for today from Berkman. If four thousand weeks is a very small number compared with infinity, Isn't it huge? Because it's more than if you'd ever been born. This has been a week of, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's been a week of, of intense difficulty and struggle. And I am no doubt that all of us at some level have been trying to figure out how do I respond? What do I do? How do I care? 
And, and here we are with the story of Jesus right in the middle of this, being offered power so that he could command his will over others. Standing on the parapet of the temple and surveying a holy land. And be your mind, he's entitled to eat. And so while I was pulling the service together and trying to figure out all the threads, at least for my part, um, I, I, I wanted to go from that reading into um, this version of the Lord's Prayer, which is for a time of conflict, and we will offer that in a moment together in unison. But even this morning, getting ready for the service, um, Jean and I were talking about what do we do? And, and so I, I will tell you right now that the staff, when they meet on, uh, when all of the people who are responsible for making sure things happen well around here, at least part of our time that morning, uh, Tuesday morning, we'll be talking about, is there something we can do to respond as a community of faith? Um, but if you've got any nudges or, or anything that will help us in our discernment, please talk to either Jean or I today, email us, talk to us. I mean, we're, dealing with all sorts of people we, who are trying to care for, not the least of whom are you. So please, um, if you've got something you need from us and, and, and that you want us to lead you into, please tell us. I invite you to share these words with me. Our parent, who art in heaven, slow to anger and of great mercy. Lover of all peoples, dear earth, hallowed be thy name. Remind us that all the nations are as nothing before thee. Their governments but a shadow of passing age. Thy kingdom come on earth. Grant to thy children throughout the world and especially to the leaders of the nations, the gift of prayerful thought and thoughtful prayer, that following the example of Jesus, we may discern what is right and do it. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to protect and to provide for all who are hungry and homeless especially those who are deprived of food and shelter, family and friends, by the tragedy of war. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us for neglecting to seek peace and pursue it, and finding ourselves in each new crisis more ready to make war than to make peace. We have, have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have, we have not, not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us not seek revenge, but reconciliation. Uh, let us not delight in victory, but in justice. Let us not give ourselves up to pride, but to prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Be present to all thy children ravaged by war. Be present to those who are killing and to those who are being killed. Be present to the loved ones of those who are killing and to the loved ones of those who are being killed. Be killed. Be killed. Be Deliver us from evil. Subdue our selfish desires to possess and to dominate, and, and forbid us arrogance in victory. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.